Okay, so this, this presentation is um, an introduction to safety instrumented systems. Um, I'm the SIS SME for now for Maverick um, in, in a company that, that does SIS but doesn't do a lot of it. Um, I, you know, I'm just kind of the guy who herds those cats. So um, we, do, we, do a, we do a wide range of services. Um, I have a paper out on exactly kind of what we do and what we don't do on the internet. And there's an at, an at sys um, part of the internet where, where I put those things and I'll probably put this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. The, um, what we're going to talk about today is um, I'm going to go through kind of what a hazard is, how a company defines what a tolerable risk is, and then how they reduce risk to where they are tolerable. And the method that's used in North America primarily is LOPA. And then I'm going to go through some definitions, um, MTBF, failure rate, availability, unavailability, and then talk about SIL, SIL um, classes and then testing. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell, and that's what's planned. Um, again, I plan to do like a, kind of a full Q&A after, but if you have any burning questions in the middle, um, feel free to speak up. Can, um, can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me okay in Houston? Yes, you can. Okay, I was about to take that as a no. Okay, so we'll start off with hazards. So um, what I want to start with is say a hazard where you're filling a tank. You know, pretty simple. Something goes wrong and the tank over, tank's overfilled. Tank overfills. Now that would be bad, but how bad would that be? And how bad depends on the consequences of that hazard. If the tank is like a mild caustic, caustic and an operator gets a burned, that's not good, but the consequences are much worse if it's a flammable chemical in a populated area and it causes a loss of many lives. So the identification and kind of classification of these hazards, most companies use a HAZOP procedure or PHA, Process Hazard Analysis. So once it's identified, the other part that goes into the, um, and, and this, these hazards are expressed in terms of lives lost, environmental impact, and economic loss. That's kind of how they classify how bad is bad. The other part is how likely is it to happen. The, um, the likelihood is expressed in terms of frequency. You know, for example, something occurs every hundred years. So you've all seen the, um, you know, the reporter standing in the rain on the hundred year flood wondering why the hundred year flood happened two, ten years ago. And what's important to know is that, yeah, the guy's an idiot, but a hundred year flood means, it doesn't mean it's gonna happen every hundred years like clockwork, it means that every year there's a one in a hundred chance of it happening. So, and that, the same holds true for safety and mean time to failure. But the frequency of these hazards, you know, is, is, is the likelihood. So if you take how bad something is and how likely it is to happen, that's your risk. You know, the, the worse it is, the more risk you're at, the more often it happens, the more risk you're at. So that, that's what plants are trying to manage and, and what we're trying to do. The, um, it'd be great if we could design all the facilities so there was zero risk of injury, injury, but as an engineer, you know that's not possible. So how small does the average frequency of a fatality need to be for a plant to be considered safe? And 100 years is, is not uncommon. The, um, Chemical companies in the United States typically operate in the 10 to the negative 5 to 10 to the negative 6 fatalities per man year range. This describes the risk to a single employee in a year. So those are some little numbers, and I don't know if they mean anything to you, so let's go through an example. If, if a plant's got 250 workers, that means every year there's 200, you know, for one year is 250 man years, and one fatality per 100 years gives you a fatality every 25,000 man years are a risk of four times 10 to the negative fifth. So that's that acceptable risk that, that they're working with. Now, you know, again, what's an acceptable risk of death? It's not, it's not an easy thing to get your mind around or even think about. So another example is driving a car. Every year, 32,000 people die, or the last year, 32,000 people die in the United States. Out of a population of 312 million, that risk is 1.01 times 10 to the negative four fatalities per year about two and a half times what a chemical plant worker faces. And we accept that risk of driving a car every day. Um, so that, that kind of puts things into perspective and that's where, those, where some of those numbers come from and, and how you define a tolerable risk. 
So let's get back to our example. The um, if if you have the tank and it overflows and it could result in one fatal one fuel pay fatality, then and the company assumes a tolerable risk of one fatality every hundred years, would you consider this plant safe? And and how do you decide? And the company is going to consider the plant safe if the probability of a fatality resulting from the overfill is less than that four times ten to the negative fifth. So let's look at a possible cause of this of this tank overflowing. If the flow control valve fails, fails open, it will overfill the tank. So what's the probability of a control valve failing? And the way to determine that is, you know, it's based on data. So if you look at the operational data for a valve in this kind of service, you get a mean time between failure of 75 years. So, and that's a number we've heard of, and I'll kind of go more into what that number means in a minute. But with an MTBF of 75 years, again, doesn't mean the valve's going to last for 75 years. It means it's the odds of failing every year is 1 in 75, which gives you odds of failing of 1.33 times 10 to the negative 2, which is still a lot more often than the tolerable risk of, 10, of 1 times 10 to the negative 5. So something's got to be done. You know, that would be way too often if you were just relying on this one control valve. So in LOPA, you look at protection layers of what else can, what else can prevent that fatality occur. So the next layer would be the BPCS system, the, um, a level transmitter, level controller, control valve. So tank, tank level gets high, control valve opens, tank level goes down, everything's good, right? But, but not quite, because the BPCS should work, but nothing works 100% of the time. So a BPCS typically is a probability of failure on demand of, of 0.1. Um, and again, I'm going to go into that later. Just trust me on it for now. So if its probability of failing is 0.1 and the initiating event is 1.33 times 10 to the negative 2, you multiply them together and the odds of them both failing, 1.33 times 10 to the negative 3. Better but still not tolerable. So there's still, you still have too much risk with this situation. And so you need another layer of protection. And that's where your SIF comes in. So your safety instrumented function, for the, for the sake of argument for this one, we're gonna add a separate level transmitter, separate logic solver, separate um, shutoff valve. So on this system, if level goes high, the controller is gonna, gonna close the valve. So you know your tolerable risk you know what your risk is without the safety system. So through the magic of algebra, you can figure out that the PFD needs to be 7.52 times 10 to the negative third. Because if you multiply all the three of those together, you get the tolerable risk. So your probability of failing for that SIF needs to be at least 7.52 to the negative third. So how do you know? How do you know that what you put in, you know, the transmitter you use, the valve you use, the that that's all going to wind up being the right, give you the right odds, give you enough protection. Well, to answer that, we're going to kind of dive into some more terminology. Yeah. And, um, and, and so we'll step away from the example for a minute and go through some terms. Mean time between failure. Um, this is something that I've heard forever, and sometimes I remember what it means and sometimes I don't, but it's the average time between a device failing. So it is, if you look at these, if, you, if up is the device working and down is the device not working, it's the average of all the Ts. And, um, and that's your average amount of runtime. Another term is a mean time to failure, or a mean time to repair, MTTR, which the nuance is like failure would be something like a light bulb. Once it fails, you're going to replace it, and MTTR would be something you're going to repair. But in practicality, everybody uses MTBF. Um, irregardless, so they kind of mean the same thing. So, so MTBF is this average uptime. Another term is failure rate, and failure rate is generally used more for components. But you know, say you have a hundred light bulbs, and over a thousand hours, a thousand hours later, five of them have failed. That's a failure rate. How many failures you had over your total operating time? So, these are these are kind of two big terms. And they're, they kind of mean the same things, but in different ways. So they're reciprocal of each other. MTBF is total operating time divided by the number of failures. And failure rate, number of failures divided by the total operating time. So it's implied that they're reciprocal, which is how I'd use that 75 MTBF to give you the, you know, a failure rate. 
which is what you need for initiating events. Another term is availability. You know, and availability is how often is it working? So it's the proportion of time that it, the equipment's able to perform its function. So it's, you know, all of the T's added up over all of the time together. And, um, you know, mathematically it's kind of simple. You may kind of wonder, okay, why are some of these downtimes longer than others? Um, you know, how, how long does it take to repair something that fails? Well, part of the problem is you may not realize it failed. Um, and availability is not the same thing as reliability. You know, reliability is how often, you know, is, is, is kind of strictly mean time between failure. How long will it run? If you have a cheap pump, but that pump is pumping every day and you know, you'll know as soon as it's down and you'll fix it quickly. So its availability is going to be high because it'll run, you'll break it, you'll put it, get it right back running again, but its reliability might be kind of crappy. So they're not exactly the same thing. Um, the, the other term is unavailability. And so unavailability would be kind of the opposite. So it's how much time are you spending in the downtime? <coughs> and, you know, mathematically it's uptime divided by downtime. You know, oh, well, you know what availability is because that was before. And then unavailability is one minus that. So, again, magic of algebra. You wind up with unavailability being your failure rate times your average of your downtimes. Now, if you're remotely hanging on, right, unavailability kind of sounds a lot like probability of failure, like what are the odds that it's not going to work when I need it? And, and that's, that's why we really care. That's why unavailability is important. Because you're looking for when am I going to need this system and it's not going to work. <coughs> so unavailability does wind up being your failure rate of undetected failures times your mean downtime. So undetected failures are failures that you don't know happen. It's that level transmitter's stuck, and when the level goes high, your tank's going to overflow because it's still stuck, but you don't know it until it, until it happens. And so that's going to lengthen these things. So going into this mean downtime before, mean downtime winds up being half, on average, half of the time between when you test something. So if you look at these failures again, and you, you imagine the scenario, I install it, everything's running great. Life's good, it breaks. But I don't know it broke. And then I either test it or I need it. But you know, in this case, I test it and I find the test. Okay, now I'm back up and running. On average, you know, you don't, it's just as likely that it's going to fail at the beginning than in the end. There's a kind of a constant probability of failure. So it might fail here sometimes. It might fail here sometimes. But on average, it's going to fail in half the time. So you can use half of your proof test time or your test time to give you this mean downtime. So finally, the point that I'm going with all this is that your probability of failure demand is half of your undetected failure rate times your proof test interval. <coughs> so the more often you test something, the more reliable it is. The less often you test it, the less reliable it is. And that's where we'll get into, you'll, you'll wind up with discussions in the plant about, well, I only want to test the safety valves every 10 years. Well, it's fine, but it's less reliable because it may have failed and you didn't know it. And, th and this is the math behind that. Undetected failure rate has more to do with what device you use, whether you're using an, an, you know, a, safer, a safer device or one, with one that's more diagnostics. So now you've got your SIF, and for a simple system, you know, for, a, for this level transmitter, I know it's undetected failure rate. I know I'm going to test it once a year. So I can figure out its, its probability of failure on demand. And the probability of failure on the SIF is the odds that the sensor is not working, plus odds that the logic solver is not working, plus odds that the solenoid is not working, plus odds that the valve is not working. So <clears throat> relatively straightforward, right? I know it's a lot, kind of a lot of math to follow, but for a simple system, it's relatively straightforward. The, um, when you get into more <coughs> complex configurations, two out of three transmitters, um, one out of two transmitters, but you're going to degrade for, for a time for another. The math gets a little more complicated, but the concepts are the same. You need how long are you going to do it, what's the failure rate of the device, and then if you have multiple systems, a thing called beta, which is the odds that a failure is going to take out both of the transmitters instead of just one. 
this wonderful math equation is actually from a presentation that's called um, SIF calculations are easy. But, um, but most of these terms we've kind of already covered, right? It's failure rates, it's proof test intervals, mean time to repair is what's your average time that you're going to repair it, which is usually 72 hours. And, um, and so it, it does wind up being manageable to cover this math and get, and get this probability of failure on demand. So, so that's how you're able to determine. So now you've got your tolerable, you've got your tolerable risk down to the level that you want. But you're not quite done. The, um, so you got a PFD, but a 7.52 times 10 to the negative 3, so you're safe. But what does SIL 1 mean? What does SIL 2 mean? What does SIL 3 mean? And why are they there? If you have a system that needs to be within this, that needs to be this reliable, it's, it's going to fall within this chart, right? And so it's going to fall at SIL 2 because it need, PFDs of this range are SIL 2. So the international standards kind of say that, okay, if you need something that's going to be SIL 2 classification reliable, it needs to be SIL, at least SIL 2 certified. So all the devices need to have been tested and, and, and are up to, you know, kind of up to snuff, up to that, that level of testing. The, um, alternatively, if a company has a lot of history with a device, like Dow uses a boatload of rose mount transmitters, then they self-certify those transmitters. So they've got more data than a bench test is going to say. Based on all their operating data, they know it will work within this range in their field conditions. So they certify it as proven in use. And um, the proven in use clause is, is a pretty powerful one. It, it allows <coughs> companies to save a lot of money. But, um, but that's what SIL is. So we need a SIL2 SIL two system, but not just any SIL2 system, one that's capable of at least this probability of failure on demand, and that, and that calculation does it. So the, the last thing I'm going to cover is testing. So once you've got the system in, you can, you know, the proof test interval is part of the calculation. So periodic testing isn't just routine inspection. It's part of making sure that the system is safe enough. So these are the kind of the different types of testing. The first one is the kind of the take-home test, right? So verification. That's what's done ahead of time to make sure that all the all the devices have the right certifications, the installation plans will work, model numbers, you've calculated the PFD, and you're sure that everything is, is going to work before it's installed. The next test is the validation test. This is the functional test. Typically it's done once. It's testing that the SIF's installed and that it acts fast enough. You know, it doesn't do you any good to close the valve, that inlet valve, if you've already overflowed the tank. So response time is typically a big part of the validation test. You know, and then lastly is the routine testing. The proof testing is repeated test. And again, what you're looking for in a proof test is those undetected failures. That level switch that got stuck and isn't gonna, isn't gonna tell you when the tank's about to overfill. The, um, some companies do proof testing on individual components. So they'll test their sensors at one rate and their valves at another. Some companies do a full validation test periodically and consider it a proof test. So it, it, that's kind of a company preference. So, material-wise, that's that's kind of all I wanted to cover. The um, you know references. I'm going to post this um, presentation to the like the SIS SCB website, and um, these are a couple of good references. This MTL reference, if you're interested, is really good at explaining the terms. It's where I got most of the definitions from the terms for, and then a couple of the others. These are pretty good. So um, that's all I've got. You all have any questions? Um, how, bad, how bad does the math blow up on, like, say, a distillation column that's got five side draws or something and you're trying to look at overfilling it? So, you know, or but not just complex, but complex process units. Yeah. Does the, the math just explode mm -hmm. exponentially? It, it depends. Um, like a, uh, what's, what's kind of common is temperature. So you might have nine temperatures on a column and you're worried about that column overheating. So you, you want any two of those temperatures to fire you off, you know, to, to fire off the SIF. And um, you don't actually have to do the math for the two out of the nine failing. It can be simplified down to, okay, let's break this into different scenarios. If the hot spot is lower, what's the, what's the requirement? Well, I need these two temperatures to work and this to happen. 
The other scenario is if the hotspot's higher. Now I need these two to work in this to happen. So generally, complex SIFs can be broken down into smaller functions, and then the, the math gets a little simpler. Some of them just are inherent, inherently complex. Um, but, but that typically you'll go to a, a fault tree analysis, which is just a <laughs> fancy word of saying a logic diagram, and, um, and work it out that way. Yeah? Um, what basis do the people performing these tests have to determine a scenario that might go wrong? If they have some type of reference that they use, or is it strictly from industry experience? When you say performing the tests, you right. mean... So how do the people uh, executing LOPA know that the scenarios they came up with, let's use the column, for instance, okay. that they covered all of the possible hazards that could happen from a column? Okay. Typically, the, um, the hazard identification is usually a separate step that's done before the LOPA, and that's the, um, you know, either PHA or a HAZOP. And the, um, I mean, like any you know, alarm rationalization or anything else, the, the people you get in the room, the, the more experience they have, the more process knowledge they have, and all that, the better. So you, you, know, you typically try and define the roles of people who have that experience. But that's the process where they go through what are all the hazards and how to identify them. And it's usually pretty ordered. Um, you know, a, a HAZOP is I'm going to look at every single piece of equipment and every possible scenario and go through it. Um, but there's no, like, spelled out government requirement or requirement that says you have to have a, this kind of engineer or anything like that. It's usually they just try and gather the best people they have. All right. Hey, Todd, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, this, this is mine, Houston. Uh, I saw that you didn't go very much into the testing, and I just had a question. You didn't really cover the material on that, but uh, it's on partial stroke testing. Uh -huh. How much does that lower your probability of failure on demand? Uh, let's say in a process where you don't often get the the, uh, the chance to actually do a full test. Let's say it's a continuous plant and they they're running that all the time and they you know they can't shut down the process to actually do a, a full strip test. Right. The um it it's you know it's I I don't know that I've seen that math laid out clearly. I know um, I know some companies don't allow start partial stroke testing at all because they don't feel it's reliable enough and, and some do. The um, it's it, it kind of goes into the what's called the diagnostic coverage. So and it's diagnostic coverage determines if I have a failure, will I be able to detect it or not? You know, and if you don't know anything about it, you assume Half my failures are going to be safe, half are going to be dangerous, half I'm going to find, half I'm not. Um, if you have more data, you can, you know, like a, a motor starter, you know, all right, 90% of the time if it fails, it's not going to fuse closed and the motor is going to continue to run. So your diagnostic coverage increases, so you have more of your failures becoming detected. Partial stroke testing allows you to increase that diagnostic coverage and more of your failures get detected quicker. That, that's where I've seen it used. It's more in the analysis. It's not, it's not necessarily considered changing the proof test interval. You know, it's not really changing the, um, you know, the, the T1. It's more increasing or decreasing the amount of the failures that are, are undetected. All right, thank you. Scott? Yeah. Hey, Scott, this is Bob Lyon in Houston. My experience with partial stroke testing is you have to do it 10 times per proof test to lower the probability of failure by one order of magnitude. Okay. So there is an inherent risk of having to do so many partial stroke tests, and that's why some companies don't allow it. I've seen a lot of times every time they do a partial stroke test, they shut down the plant. Yeah, yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> that's, a, that's definitely a test. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Ma'am? I have a question. Um, uh, the 
DC safety system seems to be getting stricter as time goes on. I, 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 what I've seen is uh, sometimes there'll be an incident at a facility and then a lot of other similar facilities will will start to think they've missed a scenario and have to go back. Are you, are you seeing a lot of that also? Um, she was saying that uh, it just seems to be more and more use of safety systems because of you know an accident and then people go back and notice that they've missed a scenario um i don't know i don't know that I've, I've necessarily seen that i think um i think some companies are kind of finally coming around you know they they are finally doing analysis where they haven't done it before where they've um just kind of assumed well it's never happened to us so it won't so i've, I've seen that um and then there's always kind of a lot of tweaking, you know, of we, you know, kind of where we are, but I, I don't know. I don't know that I've seen that specifically. Do you have any indication or data on how many companies or plants don't do proof testing as often as they should? Is that an insurance requirement or is it just a slam dunk they're going to do it no matter what? We just don't hear about it or are there a lot of facilities that skip that step? If I, you know, I don't know. I would think, you know, as an operating company, if you're gonna if you're gonna put down in something that could be shown in court that you've agreed to test this, it. I think uh, I think the majority of them try to get it into their maintenance system at those intervals. The, um, you know, the the company I'm most familiar with, they um, they kind of have a, a laid out procedure of if they don't meet it within a certain time, then they escalate it up. You know, and they and they kind of have some limits of if it's not done within the year, then it's, you know, there are they can have they can, kind of allow a little bit more, but they require more guidance. But uh, most of what I've seen is it goes into the maintenance system and is and it's pretty well carried out. The um, a lot of companies, honestly, if 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 the company's gonna gonna you know try and dodge it, there, it's more that they're just not going to use safety mm -hmm. systems. They're going to either try and design around safety systems or use it as a screening tool and just stay away from it completely. If they're going to go down the road of doing the analysis and putting it out on paper, it is a pretty strong legal incentive down the road to, to actually do the testing. Hey, Scott. Yeah. If I just may add to, to that, actually most companies, they have auditing that takes place, so you have an external uh, auditor that comes in. But a lot of them do internal auditing just to make sure that all those are carried out before the external auditor. And typically what it means with it when the external auditor comes in, a lot of times that starts factoring into the insurance that the plant is going to pay. So if those things are not taken care of properly, then whoever is insuring whatever equipment or process at this plant, then, you know, they could jack up their premiums basically. So... Uh, a lot of plans actually do make sure that these things are done in a timely manner. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, all right, well, I want to thank everybody for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, like I said, if you have any follow-on questions or need anything, just give me a shout.